my mask off first. Well, good morning. Like, like David said, my name is Ted, and I am not a pastor. And I feel like that introduction feels like the start of something in a 12-step group, maybe. My name is Ted, and I am not, I'm not a pastor. Um, yeah, hi. Um, no, I'm actually a math teacher. And so if hearing me say that brings back fears of like, remembering how you factored polynomials in high school, don't worry. The message this morning has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with the Pythagorean theorem. There will be no pop quiz afterwards. So take take a breath. (laughs) Actually, my in-laws are here today, which is kind of fun. But I'm going to tell a story they've never heard before. And it might be kind of awkward in about 30 minutes for me. So if you're not related to me, pray for me right now. (laughs) And if you are, just hang on and... Please listen with understanding, I guess. Sorry about that, mom and dad. (laughs) So anyway, y'all know what target fixation is? Target fixation is a term that I learned about when I was getting my motorcycle license. The basic principle is this. The motorcycle is going to follow your eyes. Whatever it is you're looking at, you're going to end up steering into. And that's why a lot of new riders get into accidents. They see something that they're afraid of, and they want to avoid it, but they end up locking eyes on it because they're scared of it and drive directly into it. So back in my early and mid-20s, my early and mid-20s, wow, okay. That makes me feel kind of old, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> back in my early and mid-20s, I had a couple cool motorcycles. Now, if you know Rick Brettel, he goes to our church here. He's awesome, and he used to race motorcycles. And he's probably forgotten more about motorcycles than I will ever learn in my life My motorcycles were not as cool as Rick's. But at the time that Laura and I started dating, I did have this bright yellow Suzuki GSX-R600 sport bike. And man, that thing was a rocket. I could go zero to 70 on it in first gear without having to shift. And I'm pretty sure that's like 70% of the reason why Laura started dating me was because (laughs) I had a really cool motorcycle that went really fast and I'd take her for rides when we'd go on dates. Anyway, on one of those date rides, we were up north of Shawano riding along the Wolf River on this really nice, twisty, kind of fun country road. And when she was on the back of the bike, I'd often gun it as hard as I could out of a stop because she'd squeeze me extra tight to hold on and you know, give me butterflies, <laughs> feel good feeling her squeeze me and hold on like that. Well, this particular ride was not a very good day to try that. It had rained while we were out earlier that day, and, you know, not, not that much, only for a minute or two, but it was enough to make the road wet and a little slippery. But being an impulsive 20-something who was in love, I decided I was going to gun it out of that stop sign anyway. Now, the stop sign we were at was not a good one to, to do this at because it was wet and it was slippery and it turned immediately into a left-hand turn. All right, so this is a bad idea. As we do this, my left tire briefly hydroplanes and loses traction. And when it finally grips the asphalt again, it grabbed so hard that it shot the front end of the bike up in an accidental wheelie. So here we are, doing a wheelie on a left-hand turn on a very wet road with an overpowered sports bike, and I am panicking because this is not what I had intended for. I can see the bike is not turning the way it needs to, and we're going to go straight off the road into a pretty deep ditch. And while my life is flashing before my eyes, it lingers for a moment in my motorcycle safety class, where we were taught the bike goes where the eyes go. I immediately stopped looking at the ditch. I whipped my head to the left, and I stared as far down the end of that road as I could. And sure enough, even with the front end up off the ground, the motorcycle turned, followed that left-hand turn into its appropriate lane of traffic. Once we had the opportunity to straighten out and the road wasn't turning anymore, I eased off the throttle, got two tires back on the pavement, and as soon as it was safe, I pulled over and I apologized to Laura for putting her in danger like that. Now, if you know my wife, this is not going to surprise you, but she pulled off her helmet. She grinned at me and she said, are you kidding? Can we do it again? (laughs) That is, that is my wife. The idea that we go where the eyes look extend to a spiritual truth as well. And we're going to explore that together this morning as we kick off a new sermon series called Supernatural. In this series, we'll be learning all about the healing works done in Jesus' ministry and why they still matter for us today. 
When John the Baptist asked Jesus if he was the Messiah, Jesus replied, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus' work helped authenticate his ministry. But more than that, they also give us this wonderful picture, this beautiful view into the supernatural work that God was doing in the world through the Messiah, Jesus. Today we'll be reading about one of several times that Jesus restores sight to the blind. Now this specific hearing happens in John chapter 9. And buckle up because we're going to read all 41 verses of that chapter this morning to help give us a full picture to both the physical and spiritual dimensions of what's happening as Jesus heals. Feel free to follow along in your own Bible or Bible app, but we'll also have the scripture on the screen behind me, or if you're joining us online, I think it's in front of me this morning as well. So anyway, let's read, starting in verse 1 from John chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. Now this word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he instead, he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had, been, had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But, now, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. This was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not want to listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow... We don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. 
How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So this passage in John is like right in the middle of some major conflict between Jesus and the religious elite of the day. In the chapter previous to this, in chapter 8, Jesus squares off with them regarding the sentencing of a woman to death for adultery. And shortly after this passage, in chapter 10, the Pharisees themselves scheme and try and put Jesus to death before God had planned. Now, when this passage in chapter 9 is often taught, one of the ways it's taught is it's explained with irony. Jesus gives sight to a blind man, but the religious elite themselves stay blind. There's definitely an element of that to the story, but I think there's a very deep meaning for those of us who follow Jesus that exists in the character of the blind man himself. His story arc breaks into three pieces, a healing, an inquisition, and worship. Now this morning, we'll look at all three of those parts together, and we'll talk about what they mean for our lives today, how the miracles of Jesus still take hold in our present world, in our lives. First, the healing. Verses 1 through 7 address this part of the man's story, which serves almost like a launching point for everything else that happens in chapter 9. So very briefly, let's read it again. I'm going to read it quickly because I don't want to be here till noon. I don't think you do either, right? As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Healing miracles are kind of like Jesus' thing. They're like his peanut butter and jelly. He does a lot of them in the Gospels. And there were other people in the Bible throughout the history of God's word who did healing miracles too. But up until this point in recorded history, Jesus is the only one who ever gave sight to the blind. Now, there are some who would interpret Isaiah 35, verse 5, to be messianic. And in Isaiah 35, 5, it says, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Now, the context of that passage is definitely referring to the beginning of the kingdom of heaven on earth, which Jesus is ushering in through his ministry. Now, either way you slice it, whether you interpret Isaiah 35 as directly messianic or whether you interpret it as a launching point and the sign of like the beginning of the kingdom of God, either way, Jesus is doing something associated with the beginning of God's kingdom and the fulfillment of God's promise to save that had never been done before. Now, later on, the apostles would also perform healing miracles associated with blindness and vision, but in Jesus' name. It's also interesting, this isn't the only blind person that Jesus heals. There are at least two other individuals in the gospel who are blind who Jesus healed. And interestingly, Jesus heals them differently every time. One time he does it, just by speaking. He says, go and see. Another time, he touches the man's eyes with his fingers. But in this instance, he spits, makes some mud, rubs it on the man's eyes, and commands him to wash. Now, maybe Jesus is doing this this way so that there's no question that he is the one who heals. Right? This isn't a new form of medicine. This isn't a formula to follow. But rather, sight comes from encountering Jesus himself. 
It's also interesting that Jesus chooses to make mud here. Now, from an outsider's perspective, it sure looks like he's inviting a conflict with the Pharisees. That builds into the second part of the narrative. You see, the Pharisees had forbidden a lot of very, very specific activities on the Sabbath, including, but not limited to, healing, making mud, and putting spit on someone's eyes. (laughs) Those things were in the, the Pharisees' rules about the Sabbath. Jesus had done all kinds of healings in all kinds of different ways. But in this instance, he's chosen a method that is going to put him directly at odds with the religious lawmakers. And for me, this is where part of the takeaway from this narrative lives. Jesus intersects with our lives in unique ways for his purpose. The Lord does a unique work of healing in each of us to give us and the world around us vision of who he is. Now, I've known a few Christians who have felt embarrassed by their story, by their testimony, for for one reason or another, but we shouldn't feel bad about the way that Jesus has chosen to intersect in our lives. You have become a part of his story, and he's become a part of your story in an intentional way for his purpose and for his glory. And even if we don't see it right away, just because you didn't have some miraculous moment of salvation or because you've got some deep scars and skeletons in your closet that you're ashamed of, It doesn't mean that God won't use your story to bring him worship, to give others a clear, unblinded view of who he is. That's ultimately how this story of healing ends, in worship, with clear eyes in a spiritual sense that give a rightful view of Jesus. That's the purpose our stories serve too, to see much made of Christ and to see him lifted high. And that's true no matter what our stories look like. God is not only purposeful in that he saves, but he's also purposeful in how he saves. Now, this isn't the only takeaway from John 9, but it is worth our time to reflect on and consider. Anyway, let's continue on and see what happens next. The second part of this this narrative deals with the dueling responses of a world that is spiritually blinded and someone who has been given the gift of supernatural sight. Now, this is, the, this is where the climax of the story happens. The physical healing is a setup for the change that's happening in the formerly blind man's heart. So as we read it again together, listen closely for his responses as he's questioned. Let's continue on. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He, he being the healed man, replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered already, I have, or he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. 
Nobody had ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So the pressure that the Pharisees are mounting as a result of this unsanctioned Sabbath healing is immense, right? It's telling that they questioned the dude two times. The first time, they had nothing out of him. In fact, we can see that the healed man is beginning to grasp the importance of who Jesus is. At the beginning of this story, we don't know if the man knows anything about Jesus at all, but quickly concludes that Jesus is sent from God. Mistakenly, he calls Jesus a prophet, but rightly realizing that he is from God. Now, the Pharisees didn't get the evidence that they wanted, that they needed to make a case against Jesus. So they switch approaches and question this man's parents, maybe with the hopes that his parents would out the miracle as fraudulent, say, you know, our son could see he was a plant in the crowd to make Jesus look really cool. But that's not what happens. In fact, this guy's parents are cowards. They're cowards, and there's no way around that conclusion for me as a parent. They had poured their lives into raising and keeping alive a little blind boy for at least a dozen years, which would have been no easy task back then. It's not an easy task now. In my day job, I'm a teacher, and I have one student right now who's nearly completely blind. I see that student for 90 minutes a day, and at the end of those 90 minutes, I am spent. Not because that student is a difficult student to work with, Rather, it's actually an extremely wonderful, pleasant student. But because meeting the needs of someone who can't see is tough. Tim Gehring, who is here this morning, Tim is awesome. If you don't know Tim, you should meet him. But Tim is a a teacher for students who have visual and hearing impairments. And he is doing incredible things with kids. It's not easy to meet their needs. This healed man's parents would have known that. They would have known the investment. It would have been an incredible sacrifice to raise a blind baby to adulthood back then. But instead of protecting this child that they had loved and poured their lives into, they throw him in front of the firing squad and say, don't ask us about Jesus, ask him. It's unbelievable. Now, the stakes were high, right? There's no doubt of that. On the line was excommunication from the Jewish faith. Being thrown out of the temple meant being cut off from culture, from commerce, from their people. And they chose their fear of losing their community over their own son who had been touched by Jesus. The Pharisees take them up on that offer and question their son a second time. A second time! Maybe they were hoping his story would change or that he'd slip up in some way to make Jesus look like he was a fake or a criminal. But either way, their interrogation backfires. Now, these guys are masters of the law. They're essentially religious lawyers. And they cross-examine this man, but he doesn't stray from the path. Remember my story about target fixation? The blind man who's formerly blind, both in a physical sense, but also a spiritual sense, keeps his focus tightly fixed on who Jesus is and what he had done in his life. Instead of getting pulled into an argument or into a debate, this guy cycles back to, I was blind, but now I see. Even at the as the Pharisees up their assault and claim that Jesus is an unknown, the man stays fixed on how Jesus interceded for him. He points out that no one had ever done a healing of blindness before, and that was the evidence that Jesus must be from God, which enraged the Pharisees, who would have been familiar with Isaiah 35, and they promptly throw this guy out, excommunicating from the, him from the church, cutting him off from his people. So here's application number two. Keep your eyes fixed on the target. When things got hard, questions started flying. The healed man kept his spiritual gaze fixed on Christ and the encounter that they shared. Their shared past was irrefutable evidence of the nature of who Jesus was. And that's what he stayed focused on when his life got incredibly choppy and difficult. The truth is, Jesus didn't just heal this man's eyes. He healed his spiritual vision too. That encounter with Jesus enabled this healed man to keep his spiritual focus in the right place when opposition and fear started to come up. Now, sometimes for me personally, I can lose sight of the one who has healed me. 
My family, personally, is in a period that has some uncertainty and some transition in it right now. Got another baby coming in just under two months, and that's going to mean professional and personal and relational changes that, candidly, I'm not sure how we're going to navigate. Now, the temptation for me has been to dig in harder, to try to make more happen. I'm the kind of person who doesn't get anxious over things I can control. I just go and do them. I get really anxious over the things I can't control. Studying this passage over the last few weeks has been a reminder to me to keep my focus and attitude fixed on Jesus. And even if things do fall apart for me, for us, for you, Jesus is still in control. He's still going to be there at the end of the story. Things totally fell apart for this blind man as a result of honoring and recognizing Jesus over the legal system. He gets thrown out, cut off, and is left alone. Holding a right view of Jesus costs him nearly everything. But the man's story doesn't end on that note. Jesus isn't done with him yet. Let's finish out this narrative together. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one who is speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So in another part of the gospel, one of the parables Jesus tells Jesus describes himself as a good shepherd with a large flock of sheep. A hundred of the little woolly guys, in fact. Now, when one of the sheep, just one, goes missing and is in danger, Jesus goes after that one sheep, the 1% of his flock who needs him the most. He's aware of their need, and he goes to meet it. And y'all, that's exactly how this story ends. No metaphor, no interpretation, nothing but Jesus going back after the one sheep that needed him the most. The man who was formerly blind had lost it all, or so it would seem to him. By keeping his eyes fixed on the one who had healed him, by holding true to the reality of who Jesus was and how he had intervened in the man's life, he had paid a terrible price. Now, this was a man whose entire survival up until this point had depended on his culture protecting him, his people caring for him, the generosity of his neighbors. And by being thrown out of his community... By being thrown out of the temple, he lost all of it. His entire support system was gone. Jesus hears about it and goes back to find him. And it's easy to brush over that and how short of a statement it is in this passage. But the weight of it is unmistakable. Jesus hears about the troubles of just this one guy, puts his ministry and teaching on pause, and goes back to find him. And when they reunite... The result is public worship of Jesus. This healed man had been brought into the embrace and community of Jesus. It replaces everything he lost with something better. This man's healed spiritual eyes, searching for the truth of Jesus, finds it. He is welcomed and encouraged by the healer. Because who Jesus heals, he won't abandon. Friends, this whole story is a microcosm of the gospel itself. It's the gospel in just a couple sentences. Jesus, our great healer, meets us in our weakness and moments of need. When we were powerless, he reached out and healed us uniquely so that he would be made great. By holding on and keeping our newly healed spiritual beings attuned to Jesus, we begin to lose some of the things that we held so tight to before that encounter. But ultimately, Jesus continues to meet our every need as we faithfully respond in worshiping him. When we talk about Jesus giving us eyes to see, when we we talk about Jesus healing the spiritually blind, that's what we're talking about. Jesus heals our spiritual blindness so we can see him for who he really is, so we can give him the praise he's due. We're talking about being invited to engage in some classic target fixation, to keep our eyes so trained on the one who has healed them that we collide into him over and over again. 
We're talking about filling our field of view so full of Jesus that all the other things start to get blocked out. Now, sometimes some of those other things start to creep back in, right? Fear, doubt, ambition, desire, anything that's not Jesus, anything that would want to take his place in our heart. There's a reason the Ten Commandments start with a warning against idolatry, because we're prone to lock our eyes on other things. But the good news is that Jesus is a healer of continuous renewal. If he's healed your vision once, he can do it again. And he will if you ask him. The invitation from him is there and it's waiting. There's a number of places we might be today. Maybe you've never had that initial encounter with Jesus. You don't know what it's like to have your eyes fixed on him. And if that's you, please know that there is healing and belonging in Jesus that's available for you. In today's narrative, the man was healed only by the power of Jesus, but he did have to respond in faith and go wash himself in the water as Jesus told him to. If that's something that you want for yourself, there's going to be a step of obedience and faith that's required to trust the words of Jesus and to follow after him. Maybe you've already had that healing encounter. You're spiritually in lockstep with Jesus, and that's awesome. Hold on to him. I hope today's message is an encouragement for you, that no matter what comes of following closely, that what Jesus gives us is so much greater than anything that we might give up by following him. Or maybe you're distracted by other things. I think there's probably quite a few of us who are in this boat this morning. I know I regularly am. Just because we've lost focus on who Jesus is and what he's done doesn't mean that we can't refocus. Now, in our own strength, it'd be totally impossible. But Jesus is the one whom sight comes from. He is the source of our strength and our hope. And he's ready to do another work in us to bring us back to him. He'll come for us if we lose our way. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for being the one who heals, for being the one who gives us sight. Lord, we would ask this morning that that you would break away some of the things that cause spiritual blindness in our hearts, that you would allow us to lock eyes on you, that we would be so focused and so full of you that everywhere we go, we are colliding into you and that the world around us sees the result of that collision. Lord, we love you. We pray that you would increase our love for you. And that as we leave together this morning, that we would walk in the way that you are walking in, that we would follow the path that you have laid out for us. Amen.